right. Thank you, Brother Lawrence. Take your Bibles and join me in turning to Exodus chapter number 33 tonight. Exodus chapter number 33. Good to see you this evening. And as Brother Lawrence was talking, yes, there is a big change of pace between Lattimore, North Carolina and Northern Virginia. Uh, There are some of you, your spirituality is tested by the way we drive back home. The light turns green. And we count to three, and then we decide to accelerate. Uh, For some of you, the light is still red, and the horn is honking. And you're like, please, would you move on? But I'll admit, there are several things about Northern Virginia that certainly do appeal to me. And uh, sometimes it is nice to have a little faster pace of life. But I want to comment on this before I get too engrossed in starting the message Uh, I am amazed for how many of you are badgered by northern Virginia traffic and yet you come to church happy. I admire you for that. Uh, Probably for me, I would come to church and my hair would have fallen out by now and uh, I would have just not been in the frame of mind to worship. But, you know, for many of you, that's just old hat. But I was watching you uh, before the service and seeing some of you come in and, uh, of course, I know it's... A busy pace of life up here, but I thought, wow, you know, I wish I could take some of that back home. I've been in some churches on a midweek service and people look like death warmed over. And uh, you try preaching to that, you know, it's a little tough sometimes. And, uh, but you folks uh, certainly don't discourage us by, by your countenance by any means. And I appreciate your uh, working through uh, everything to be here tonight. Uh, I was telling Brother Lawrence and Brother Devane, when we first met each other, Uh, if we would have looked at each other and said, you know, one day we're going to be together at Temple Baptist Church in Herndon and Brother Lawrence, you're going to be on the pastoral staff and Brother Devane, you're going to be a youth pastor. And they looked at me and said, yeah, Brother Bill, you're going to be the president of the college. Uh, We would have all laughed our heads off. Uh, We had no idea really of what God had in store. All we could do is just take one step at a time. And uh, listen, there's some of you teenagers tonight. It delights me. Uh, Boy, to see an entire section uh, filled with young people. But I can make you this promise. If you'll just follow God one step at a time, listen, you'll be amazed at what God has for you. And uh, I hope that you'll do that. You're in in a good place tonight. And I'm so glad that God's placed you here at Temple Baptist Church. Well, I guess they've dismissed the children. Uh, That was the time for the disgruntled adults to leave too if they could have snuck out. And uh, it's amazing to watch children, how eager they are to go to children's services. I wish adults were that eager to go to adult services. And you say, well, you don't give out candy. You're right, I don't. But uh, anyway, you can learn a lot from children if you look at them. We certainly miss Pastor tonight and uh, Mrs. Pittman, but I'm so glad uh, that you have a pastor so conscientious about taking care of his wife. A great lesson learned uh, in in watching him this week and uh, appreciate them very much. Exodus chapter 33, let's begin reading in verse number 7. Exodus 33 in verse 7, it says, And Moses took the tabernacle and pitched it without the camp, afar off from the camp, and called it the tabernacle of the congregation. And it came to pass that everyone which sought the Lord went out into the tabernacle of the congregation, which was without the camp. And it came to pass... When Moses went out into the tabernacle, that all the people rose up and stood every man at his tent door and looked after Moses until he was gone into the tabernacle. And it came to pass, as Moses entered into the tabernacle, the cloudy pillar descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle. And now notice this last phrase, and the Lord talked with Moses. Do you know tonight we live in a day of communication? We're all about a communication, aren't we? I'm talking about many of you right now. You have a device in your pocket or in your hands or in your car that has more power than the first computer you ever touched, like a Commodore 64. We thought it was great to have 64 kilobytes, not megabytes, kilobytes of RAM. And we've graduated to where now we have computers. You can buy a Mac. You can buy a PC. It has a lightning speed. Now they have solid state drives. For those of you that are impatient and hate wasting your life away for Windows to boot up, you buy something with a solid state drive and just instantaneously boots up. 
I think about the ways that we used to communicate when I was a kid. I used to call my grandmother and we still had an old rotary dial phone. I understand I've just dated myself with the younger generation. What is a rotary dial phone? Well, lest you make too much fun of me, I'm at least glad it wasn't an old party line phone. Years ago, they used it out in the country where four and five people on the same line and you knew who called by how many rings it was and usually you had at least one nosy neighbor who was listening in on every one of your calls regardless of how many times it rang. I remember the first time my boys a few years ago saw a rotary dial phone. We were in the town hall in Lattimore and they said, Dad, what is that? I looked at them as if to say, what do you mean, what is that? That's a telephone. They said, really? I said, yes, it's a rotary dial phone. I said, let me show you how it works and how you stick your finger in the dial and you push it all the way to the metal piece and it goes back. You dial the right ten numbers, the area code and the seven-digit number, and you can call mom. And they were like, can we call everybody that we know on this thing? They were so excited. I remember when I was a kid when Touch Tone came out. I can still remember at my neighbor's house, they had it, we didn't. Remember, we had the rotary dial phone. And I remember sitting there with the phone and pushing the buttons and noticing that each button had a different pitch. And in my ignorance, I'm sitting there pushing buttons trying to play happy birthday, failing to realize that I'm calling unsuspected people all over America. (laughs) It's one of those things. And then we went from rotary dial phone. Remember we went to cell phones? You remember the first ones that we used to have? You know, they were like bricks with a large metal antenna that you pulled out. Yes, the kind that had the clip that hung on your belt, sir, and you had to wear suspenders to keep it from pulling everything down. (laughs) These phones were big. And then I remember after the first cell phone that I had, I remember graduating to a flip phone. I thought that was the greatest thing. All of a sudden, I go from building material brick to something that is thin, and I just flip it open. I remember when texting first started, people thought it was the coolest thing to look at a nine-digit pad and have to press a number three times to get the right letter before you went on to the next one. Now, at that point in the game, I said, that is crazy. Why would people do such a thing? Life's too short to push and run through the wrong one and have to go back all over it again, misspell one thing, and it was an act of Congress in order to get it, get it right. Matter of fact, at that point in my life, I said, I will never text. That is absolutely crazy. Well, that changed a few years later. You know, there's some people, instead of talking to them on the phone, it's just a lot easier to text them a one-word answer. Yes, no. And by doing so, you don't waste five and ten hours a day just talking about the weather to everybody that calls you. It's amazing to me. I can text my wife. She can text me. I can be sitting at my desk and on just a a dreary day, my wife will shoot me a text. Maybe it says, I love you or something like that. And I just look at that screen and I say, wow, that's great. And I text her back and say, I like you too. No, I say, I love you too. (laughs) It's amazing. Email. You know, now for some of you, you're like, I don't do email, but it still blows my mind. Michael Raines, who's a missionary in Kenya, East Africa, we were in the dormitories together my freshman and sophomore year. Michael's been serving the Lord in Kenya, and you know, every Sunday I get an email from him. I got one from him on Sunday afternoon, updating the events of the day, and he sends it, and I get it in a matter of seconds, and it blows my mind to think that in a matter of seconds... A message from thousands of miles away comes directly to me. If you've been listening for the last five minutes, you've got to come to this conclusion. Human communication has excelled greatly over the last ten years. No doubt about it. There's no reason, sir, why you ought not talk to your wife or ma'am, why you ought not talk to your husband. There's no reason. I mean, some of you have your kids at a moment's notice. At any given moment, you know where they're at by those electronic leashes that you give them. And while it's safe to say that our human communication has excelled greatly over the last ten years, ladies and gentlemen, the sad realization is this. Our divine communication is sadly lacking. 
What a shame it would be tonight to gloat over messages from your friend and yet you've not heard from God in weeks. What a shame it would be for us tonight to sit in our pew and listen, we know everybody else's business on social media, but one stark omission, we don't know God's business. But I have found that while we are so enthralled with communicating with each other, we have failed miserably in letting God communicate with us. And I want to take you back thousands of years before Verizon was ever hatched in the mind of man. I want to take you back thousands of years, long before there was ever a new every two, and long before there was an apple, and I want you to see that God has been communicating with man century after century after century. And ladies and gentlemen, His communication to us tonight is just as important as it's ever been. When's the last time God has communicated to you? If it's been some time, it's not because of a technology failure or a dead battery. It's because of a sick heart. And tonight I want to talk to you about what it means to have real divine communication from God. Because without it, you can't have revival. Let's begin by looking at verse number 7 tonight. As we begin our story, Moses took the tabernacle and pitched it without the camp. Modern day vernacular would cause us to say, what did he do? You think in modern day time, you'd say, what does that mean? Did that mean Moses just took the tabernacle in his hand and threw it? No. No, the tabernacle was actually a glorified tent, if I could say it that way. It was a place in the early days where it was symbolic of where God met with man and it was a very holy and a very consecrated place. Everywhere that Israel went, they they set up that tabernacle. And let me tell you something, that tabernacle was a very, very important place. As a matter of fact, when Israel saw it, they said, that is a serious place. And when they saw somebody going to it, they dropped what they were doing. And we're going to see that in a moment. But the tabernacle, I could very simply say it, the tabernacle was the dwelling place of God among the nation of Israel. Now, I want to ask you a question tonight. What is the New Testament parallel to the Old Testament tabernacle? There may be some of you tonight on the surface, you'd say, well, I'll tell you what, I think the the New Testament parallel to the tabernacle is the church. Now, that sounds good, but it's just not that way. Listen, if you listen to these people, by the way, folks, if you want to get steeped in false doctrine, engross yourself in podcasts and all kinds of things online. I have found if you want to get the best substance and you want to get it from a trustworthy source, this place is the best place to get it. You say, why is that? My pastor doesn't have any special dispensation. You know what? Your pastor, he puts his coat on just like I do, one arm at a time. But there's a big difference between that man and everybody else you listen to that you don't know for anything. You get to observe his character and you know he loves you. There's some of you tonight, listen, you get involved, you listen to these podcasts. If you ever listen to a preacher and he says, listen, the church was in the Old Testament and the church was the tabernacle, turn him off. Because that's not true. You say, well, then what is the New Testament, tab- what is the New Testament equivalent to the Old Testament tabernacle? Remember I told you tonight that the Old Testament tabernacle was the dwelling place of God. It is where deity dwelt. Ladies and gentlemen, I propose to you tonight that your body is the tabernacle of the Spirit of God. And you know what is absolutely amazing? You're experiencing something tonight that no Israelite experienced. In the same sense that you did. We find at times that Old Testament saints were indwelt by the Holy Spirit, but it was not a permanent indwelling. Samson is a prime example. But you know the day that you got saved, the Holy Spirit of God took up residence in your soul. And tonight, as you sit in this pew, listen to me, your body is the dwelling place of deity. That ought to control what we watch. It ought to control what we see. It ought to control what we do when we realize the God of heaven dwells within us. Too many times as Christians, we are so careless in the way that we live. Some of you tonight would say, well, I would never take my children to this. I would never take my children to this. Their young eyes should never see it. And yet, we don't even think twice about bringing God. 
Because he indwells us. So the tabernacle was the dwelling place of deity. But notice with me in verse number 8, it says, And it came to pass when Moses went out into the tabernacle, that all the people rose up and stood every man at his tent door and looked after Moses until he was gone into the tabernacle. You understand Israel, they know what that place is. They see that it's a very special place. They know that when a man goes there, it's because he's going to meet with God. You know, it's very interesting what they do. They stop everything they're doing and they fasten their eyes on Moses. Some of you tonight say, well, that was because they were nosy Baptists like we are. There are lots of nosy Baptists. I've been in... I've been one myself on a number of occasions. But it wasn't because they were being nosy. Let me tell you, their heart at that point is overtaken by by being overwhelmed by an awe of realizing that man is about to meet with God. Something special is about to happen. You know what, folks? Every time you meet with God, every time you meet with Him in the morning and you open up this book, hey, regardless of how you feel, I'm not a morning person. Some of you are not a morning person. That's why some of you have taken up coffee. I hear of people, they say, oh, after two cups, I'm ready to go in the morning. For some of you, maybe it's two, you know, it's two, not just cups, but you just have to, two batches you have to brew. But you know, regardless of how you feel, let me remind you, when you open this book, you know that ought to be a special thing. It's special because who's talking to you? God. And folks, can I tell you, in in our day and time, in our busyness, you know, in northern Virginia, it's busyness. In the south, I'm sure it's some other besetting thing. But it never ceases to amaze me, regardless of your geographical region, whether it is busyness or whether it is slowness, we still manage to lose a sense of the specialness of this book. Folks, I propose to you that there are many ways in which we see that we've lost the specialness of communication from God. It's a shame when a Muslim will treat the Quran with more reverence than a Christian will treat the Bible. You say, well, there's a lot of things that I, I, I wouldn't want to learn uh, from whatever, whatever group in the world. But there are some that treat their sacred texts much, with much more respect than we do the Bible. You know why? Because we've lost the specialness of it. Why is it that we can leave it in a certain place for days and be unaware of where it's at and unconcerned? I'll tell you why. Because we've lost the specialness of it. I'm talking to some of us here tonight. There was a time in our lives, listen, when we came to that book in the morning or the afternoon or the evening, it was the highlight of our day. And now we sit here tonight cold and distant, detached from the one who wants to speak to us and tell us the truth unlike anybody else. The nation of Israel knew that communication from God was a special thing. My question is, is is it special to you tonight? Folks, I believe revival will take place when we bear up under great honesty and cast ourselves before God and say, Lord, I've loved the things of this life more than you. And one of the ways in which it's shown is I've taken your communication with me for granted. But then notice with me verse number 9. And it came to pass, as Moses entered into the tabernacle, the cloudy pillar descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle. You and I, we're camped out away from the tabernacle. We're in the main part of the encampment. We'll look out in the distance, and maybe by this time Moses is a gray-haired man. But don't let the gray hair fool you. When he died, listen, he was just as strong and could see better than any of us. But we see Moses as he's heading towards the tabernacle. And then we see a strange phenomenon happen. The strange phenomena that happens is all of a sudden a cloudy pillar descends over the tabernacle. This is not predicted by the meteorologist. By the way, if you've been watching the weather, we're probably going to get a lot of rain in the next few days. 
I was reminded this morning to pray for one of our alumni, Harry Peart, who is serving the Lord in Haiti. That thing hit today. I haven't heard anything, but I trust he's doing well. But no meteorologist could say, hey, it's going to be partly cloudy on this day and it's going to, that cloud's going to be right... O-. Listen, it was not by chance. It was by divine design. That cloudy pillar symbolized the presence of God. And that cloudy pillar carried great significance in the nation of Israel. Why? That's how they were led. A pillar, a cloudy pillar by day, a pillar of fire by night. Boy, could you imagine how easy, if I could say it that way, it'd be to live. Just want to know what God wants to do, just follow the cloudy pillar. You wake up in the morning, the cloudy pillar's over the car waiting for you to go to work. The cloudy pillar leads you down the road. It leads you around the detours and the wrecks and the accidents. And finally, you end up at work. And then, man, maybe in the middle of the day, you say, I wonder what I should do. And all of a sudden, that cloudy pillar leads you to the mall. You're like, okay, I'll go. You say, what should we eat tonight? There's no arguing. Just follow the cloudy pillar. Oh, it's turned dark. It's into a pillar of fire. And it has led us to the steakhouse. Oh, that's great. Not McDonald's. Sometimes people say, boy, I wish it was just that easy. You know, I've talked to young people. They get a little bit disgruntled. And I probably felt this way at times. It's like, what in the world am I supposed to do? I'm looking. I can't find anything. Some of you say, I wish I could just see a cloudy pillar. I just wish I could see a pillar of fire. I'd go go find it. But the Bible tells us in the New Testament, we have to walk by faith, not by sight. And it's interesting, in Proverbs chapter 3, and verse number 6, it says that if we'll acknowledge Him in all of our ways, listen to me, He'll direct our paths. You may not have a cloudy pillar tonight, you may not have a pillar of fire, but I promise you this, Christian, if you trust God, He'll lead you. Some of you young people say, who am I going to marry? Hey, I've got news, you'll trust God, let Him do the picking, and you'll not regret it. Where am I going to work? What am I going to do? There's some of you tonight, you're in a balance. You have uncertainty. You can't see it. You have to walk by faith, not by sight. You're not the first one. You won't be the last one. Abraham went out not knowing whither he went. The world would have called him a fool, but God called him faithful. If you want God's leading tonight in your life, listen, you'd do well to look to God's presence. You really want God's leading tonight, listen to me, then have your ears tuned to Him more than anyone or anything else. But then we come to that intriguing phrase, and the Lord talked with Moses. Now you say to yourself, what is that? You say tonight, and the Lord talked with Moses. What does that mean? And the Lord talked with Moses. Here's a question for you. Has the Lord ever talked with you? Mm. That's one of those preacher trick questions, isn't it? You ever notice how sometimes we preachers, we ask those trick questions and you say, well, it depends on what you mean by it. Let me state very clearly tonight, the Lord has never spoken to me in an audible voice. If you're here tonight and you say, well, I beg to differ. God has spoken to me in an audible voice. I don't believe that's the way He speaks today. Uh, There's been times I've heard voices. They came out of nowhere, but there was somebody behind the voice. Whether it was your brother in the closet or your roommate in the other bedroom trying to scare you, whatever the case. But when it comes to God speaking to us in an audible voice, He doesn't talk to us in an audible voice. I've never heard the audible voice of God. But as I stand before you tonight, I can assuredly say that God has definitively talked to me. You say, boy, that really is something. I just don't know how you can come up to such a conclusion. I'll tell you how tonight he talks to us through the 66 books in your lap this evening. 
There's not a soul in here tonight that can say, God has never talked to me. Listen, even the the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth His handiwork. And tonight, you have this revelation from God. And whether you understand or realize it tonight, understand this book is God's revelation to you and God talks to you through this book. Now, I want to ask you a question tonight. When's the last time God has talked to you through this book? When is the last time that you read the Bible and you came away and you said, You know what? That was specifically for me. Jeremiah said it this way. He said, Thy words were found, and I did eat them, and they were unto me the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. Have you ever sat down at a table and ate your favorite dessert? How would you feel when it was over with? Don't you love some of the hardest decisions you'll ever make in life or at a dessert table at a church fellowship? You say, hard, those ought to be easy. Listen, when you've got homemade coconut pie competing with a coconut cake and cherry, and cherry pie and you've got all kinds of different things, listen, those are hard decisions. And so you know what I do in those instances? Instead of using those little dessert plates that those ladies put on the table that are the size of a 50 cent piece, I go back up to the front of the line and I get one of the main dishes. After all, it's segmented so my banana pudding will not leak over into my cherry pie and my cherry pie will not get into my coconut cake. And I take that and I eat it. And once I'm done, you know what? I set the plastic fork down. I take the napkin and wipe my mouth according to my wife's teachings of manners. Set it down and I push away from the table and I pat myself and say, Boy, that was good. Some of you look at me like, I've never done that before. You are a poor soul. (laughs) It's hard to do that with tofu and broccoli and asparagus, but... There have been times in physical satisfaction I've pushed away from the table and I've said, boy, this is absolutely great. I believe that's the same heartbeat that's intimated by Jeremiah when he says, Thy words were found and I did eat them and they were unto me the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. When's the last time you came away from the Bible and you said that was specifically for me? For many of us tonight, it maybe has been a long time. Now, I'm going to give you the confessions of a Baptist preacher this evening. Do you know, every time I read the Bible, every day that I read it, it doesn't always hit me with the same magnitude. I'm not going to stand here in front of you tonight and say, Boy, every time I read the Bible, I could write an entire chapter of devotional commentary and usher you into the heavenlies like C.H. Spurgeon. (laughs) I can't do that. But I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, there's some days in which God uses that book and He speaks to me in a whisper. And there are other times I read it and He speaks to me with a shout. There are some days in which my heart is raised up. There are other days in which my heart is crushed. And what I'm describing to you, ladies and gentlemen, is something that we don't experience nearly as much as we ought. The world is looking for a real Christianity, but a real Christianity is not going to be manifested as long as we distance ourselves from this book. There are some of you tonight, you say, Brother Bill, my heart is so cold, it's been a long time since I've opened this book and read it on my own accord out of church. There are others of you that say, Brother Bill, I read the Bible, but my heart feels dead. And then there are some of you tonight, You say, I read it and God is doing a work in my life. Just be honest about where you're at tonight. And when you leave this place, see that the most important communication that you can ever hear is from God. And the Lord talked with Moses. You ever had anybody really important talk to you? You ever had an athlete talk with you or perhaps a politician? My, being this close to Washington, D.C., you've probably seen your share. 
It it humors me sometimes to talk to people and they'll say, boy, you never guess who I ran into the other day. I ran into so-and-so. And and you'll be like, oh, wow, that's pretty neat, you know. I remember when I was a kid, I was four years old. My dad told me, he said, Alton, I'm going to take you to Tweetsie Railroad, which was an amusement park in Blowing Rock, North Carolina. And so I went to uh, Blowing Rock, and I'll never forget, we went to Tweetsie Railroad. I was so excited, but it wasn't because of the train, and it wasn't because of the rides. It was because my childhood hero, Fred Kirby, was at Tweetsie Railroad. Fred Kirby headed up a Saturday morning cartoon show when cartoons were a lot more innocent than what they are today. And Fred Kirby was the epitome of the good guy. He wore a red shirt with white tassels, white pants, white cowboy hat, huge belt buckle, and Fred Kirby was the epitome of the good guy. And I knew Fred Kirby would be at Tweetsie Railroad, and I'm telling you, the very moment that I bounded through those uh, ticket booths and I went in there, lo and behold, in all of his glory, I saw Fred Kirby standing beside of two big, huge horses that were fake horses, a little one for little tykes like me and a big one so that big people could get on. And man, as a four-year-old boy, I sunk my hand into Fred Kirby's hand and just melted like butter. I don't remember what I said, but I just knew one thing. Fred Kirby said something to me. I went home. You know what happened? I told everybody about it. Hey, hey, Grandma, boy, I talked to Fred Kirby. You know, that man on Saturday morning. Yes, I saw him with my own eyes. He shook my hand and he talked to me. It was the talk of the neighborhood. Hey, Eric, I want you to know I saw Fred Kirby. Yep, that man we see on television every Saturday morning. He talked to me yesterday. You can imagine a little kid getting excited about that. There's some of you, you get giddy whenever you meet an athlete. You tell everybody about it. But really, this is what I'm asking tonight. When is the last time that we have been overwhelmed, that we have been overcome, that we have been so excited because we heard from the Creator of the universe? When is the last time we were overwhelmed in knowing that in the midst of 7 billion people, God reached down the creator of the universe and spoke to me through this book? He's greater than any athlete regardless of what those athletes think. They say, I've got a lot of money. They may have a lot of money, but sometimes not a lot of sense. And they don't own the cattle on a thousand hills either. But too often we get enthralled from hearing from other people rather than hearing from God. But then continue with me in verse number nine or verse number ten. It says, And all the people saw the cloudy pillar stand at the tabernacle door, and all the people rose up and worshipped every man in his tent door. I just want to briefly focus on one word for a moment, and that's the word worshipped. When they saw this happening, all of a sudden now, all of Israel is put in a mode of worship. Let me ask you a question. What does it mean to worship tonight? I believe the word worship is one of the most misunderstood words in churches today. You know what some people think worship is? Worship is having a drum set on the platform and worship is having a guy with a soul patch right here. You say, why does he wear that? Because he can't grow it anywhere else but right here. And he's been saving up since he was a teenager right there. And get up and lead what is really the equivalent of rock music and people sway back and forth and they say that is worship. I mean, in a lot of churches, they talk about having a worship pastor and that worship pastor is nothing more than a song leader, choir director and yet they call him the worship pastor. I think that's a misnomer. Because in churches today, so often, you know what they think of worship as being? Merely music. But I'm going to tell you something tonight. When you really understand worship, you see that it is so foundational. Worship takes place in an offering. Worship takes place in a choir number. Worship takes place in a preaching service. Because worship in the Old Testament did not mean merely music. Worship literally means this, to submit. To bow down. For the people of Israel, they bowed down their hearts to God at this moment and they worshiped God. There are many people today in churches, they don't know what worship is. 
Some people think if you come to a Tuesday night revival meeting when you could have been doing a lot of other things, that that in and of itself is worship. Let me tell you, if you're here tonight and your heart is unbowed towards God, you're not worshiping right now, you're occupying space in an auditorium. But God wants you to worship Him. You see, young people, you can wear a uniform to school. Moms and dads, you can come to church in a shirt and tie and yet have an unbowed heart towards God. And if you think that worship is merely occupying an auditorium, you're missing the essence of worship. I think if we had a greater understanding of worship, we would approach our services differently. We would approach our Bible reading differently. If we would just be reminded once again that we're bowing our hearts before God. But then verse number 11 is where we end. And the Lord spake unto Moses face to face as a man speaketh unto his friend. That's a powerful descriptive phrase for me tonight. Face to face. Here's another quick trick question for you. Aren't you glad when people ask you, they at least let you know it's going to be a trick question first. I guess then it's not really a trick question, is it? We'll discuss that after the service. Has any person in this room ever seen God? I mean, after all, the Bible says that Moses saw Him face to face. At least that's what people say. I remember early on in my ministry, I was exposed to teaching children. I think one of the best ways to prepare preacher boys is have them teach junior church and talk to children. Man, if you can't explain the gospel to a fourth grader, forget it. You probably won't get it right with an adult either. And I remember one day I was teaching a group of kids. It was a rather challenging group of kids, kindergarten through sixth grade in a Bible class. Do you understand the breadth of the attention span there? You understand, you've got kindergartners that all they can think about is in terms of puppy dogs and bicycle chains and then sixth graders who think they're on the verge of manhood. It's a challenge. And sometimes one of the worst things you can do is ask a group of children a question because they never have the right answer. At least it seems to be. I asked a question to all those, all those people in that, in that classroom. I said, listen here, class. I said, how many of you have ever seen God? And I'm telling you, I'm teaching kids, most of them raised in solid Christian homes. I mean, I would expect all of them to know the answer. I said, how many of you have ever seen God? And there was one boy that shot up his hand. I'll never forget it. Wearing a flat top, brown headed, big blue eyes, dark complexion, throws his hand up. I thought to myself, oh no. I said, uh, Ryan, ha- have you ever seen God? This boy was from West Virginia. His parents were from West Virginia, had a thicker accent than I had. And he looked at me and he said, mm hmm. I said, Ryan, where did you see God? I'll never forget his answer. He looked at me and said, I've seen him on television. I, uh, I looked at him, and how do you let a boy down softly like that in Bible class? You know, I looked at him, and I said, Now, Ryan, I said, I don't know what you saw on television, but I do know this. That wasn't God. Maybe that was somebody pretending to be God, but that wasn't really God. Do, do you understand that, Ryan? And with a blank look, that little flat top head of his, he went, He didn't understand more than anything else. But I am proud to say now as a youth pastor, he's figured that out. He's gotten through that theology lesson. But that little boy, he thought he'd seen God. I've talked to people, they say, well, uh, I've seen God before. Listen, no man, the Bible says this, no man has seen God at any time. And you know that one statement to me trumps every ounce of human experience. Because God's Word can be trusted, but your feelings cannot be trusted. That's a very important lesson for you to learn throughout life. There are times you don't feel right. There are times that you don't feel saved. There are times that you feel like hurting somebody else. You live a life by feelings, you'll be in jail. You live a life by God's Word, and listen to me, it'll help you. 
But no man has seen God at any time. And somebody says, oh, well, the Bible must have a mistake here. Well, you might have misread it because the Bible didn't say that Moses or that the Lord saw Moses face to face. Here it is. It says, and the Lord spake unto Moses face to face. It's not talking about a physical proximity, but it's talking about a spiritual intimacy face to face. Let me illustrate this humanly speaking. Uh, Did you know every one of us in this room, we have what's called a personal zone? Did you know that? Oh, I have one. There are times after service, a well-meaning person may come up to me and put their hand in mine and they step into my personal zone. mean nothing by it. And I just kindly lean out. And sometimes somebody is this they can't hear you or you can't hear them, they lean in a little closer. They take a step into you, I take a step back. And on a few rare occasions, my heels have clicked against the wall and I am trapped as they have backed me into a corner. I remember in college, I had a roommate. He came to my room, he was so mad, he was so upset, he was so hot. I said, Dave, what's wrong? He said, this boy got in my girlfriend's personal space and I wanted to rip his head off, he said. Some of you ladies tonight, if a boy in the school got this close to you, you'd be like, it'd be a good idea for you to back off because if I don't take care of you, my dad will. There's some of you men, listen, you'd say, hey, there's a space in front of my wife's face that only me and my children and her parents can be in, but nobody else. And you have every right to demand that. Why? Because it's expected to be an intimate relationship. When God spake to Moses face to face, let me tell you, it indicated that they had an intimate communication one with another. I want to ask you tonight, how intimate is your communication with God? Now listen, as a slick evangelist, I could give a real cheesy invitation. I could say, how many of you tonight want to draw closer to God? And the truth is, every Christian in this room that's worth shooting ought to raise their hand for that. I mean, don't we sing, draw me nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died? But I'm not just asking with some generality tonight. I'm talking about some of you. Listen, there was a time when you could sense God's moving and presence in your life. And tonight, as a Christian, you seem hollow. There was a time when God dealt in your heart in such a way you felt like it was face to face. And tonight is a far cry. Thousands of years later, ladies and gentlemen, it is possible for people at Temple Baptist Church to have that kind of communication in which God speaks to you face to face as a man speaketh with his friend. But we have to be willing to admit that we're not where we ought to be. I'm not trying to set an unreasonable standard tonight. There are some days... God works on me in a major way through His Word. There's other times God gives me just enough to get me to the next hill or to get me through the next valley. But I'm afraid in our technological craze we're more addicted to our iPhones than we are the Bible. In our technological craze We desire to see texts from our best friends, but when's the last time we've gotten a verse from God? In our hustle and bustle, for somehow, some reason, some way, we're very quick to grab our tablets, we're very quick to grab our phones, to see the latest update, to see the latest status update, to see the new Instagram picture, to find the new tweet, or to make the next LinkedIn connection. And yet our Bible sits to the side, untouched and unthought of. Ladies and gentlemen, when you leave this service tonight and you head into the middle of this week, you be reminded the greatest communication you'll ever receive is communication from God. And it's high time for all of us to treat it as if it's special, like Israel did of old. Let's bow our heads together. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed tonight. 
I want to ask you in a moment about your communication with God. But I want you to think about it for just a moment. I want you to think about the manner in which you have been communicating with God and Him communicating to you, let's say over the last couple of weeks. Could I do that? Make something just uh, of a fashion we can wrap our arms around. Christian, I want to ask you tonight, if you look over your life the last couple of weeks, how would you size up how God has communicated with you? Have you been seeking His face through the Word or have you just become so busy? Have you prided yourself on sending thousands of texts a month and yet not hearing a thing from God? Folks, this is just the busy day in which we live. We have to refocus. We have to reprioritize. There is nothing that can replace in a church, no amount of talent, no amount of ability can replace a walk with God. And it's high time for us to see where our hearts are at. Now, with all that being said, I want to ask you tonight, I wonder how many of you in this room would say this. You'd say, Brother Bill, I'm a Christian tonight. I know that. But you know, it's been quite some time since I've sensed like I've had that face-to-face communication from God. Maybe there was a time in your life where it was much more intimate than it is tonight. For some of you, you say, Brother Bill, I've not even been in the book on a regular basis. Well, listen, it should be obvious for you tonight to draw nigh to Him. But there may be some of you, maybe you've let some issues of life quench your fire. Maybe you've just felt like your soul is in a drought and when you read Exodus 33, you say, God, that is where I need to return. Then tonight is the night to do that. And I wonder how many in this room tonight you'd say, Brother Bill, I'm a Christian. And boy, God has certainly dealt in my heart. I need what Moses had in Exodus 33. I need to get back to that face-to-face communication with God. And I long for that tonight. And God has worked in my heart. Would you pray for me? If that's you tonight, would you slip your hand up and keep it up just a moment? Slip it up and keep it up. Thank you. You may put them down. In just a moment, we're going to have a time of invitation. I I would just encourage you, seek the Lord while He may be found. I believe while God is knocking, that's the time we ought to respond. I can't think of a better way for us to conclude our service than to just draw near together tonight and to bow our hearts and to worship Him in this invitation. And may the trinkets of this world lose their glare and may they lose their shiny appearance And tonight, let's turn our eyes back upon Jesus. Before I pray, I want to ask this question. Is there somebody here tonight? You'd say, I'm here in your midst. And preacher, the truth is I'm not even saved. You see, God's very definitively spoken to you. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's God's message for every person in this room. I wonder if there'd be somebody tonight you'd say, Alton, would you pray for me? I'm not even saved. Tonight I know that I need to hear the gospel and I need to trust Christ. That's my need tonight. And you'd say, Alton, would you pray for me this evening? Anybody like that as I look across the auditorium? Just a moment. Just a moment. All right, in a moment. We're going to stand together and I'm going to pray. I want to invite you, Christian. Listen, if God's dealt in your heart tonight, don't you be ashamed of that. You just come ahead. Before you delve into the middle day of the week, let it be said that here is a Christian whose heart is burning again to see and to hear from God and for God to speak to them face to face in an intimate fashion through this book. Why don't you come tonight? Would you join me in standing? Our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Join me in standing tonight. Father... Lord, as we close our service together, I just pray that the work that you've done would continue to burn in the hearts of your people. And Lord, I pray tonight that our hearts would be tender and responsive to your word. And I pray that as we gather around and as we speak to you tonight, 
Lord, knowing that a broken and a contrite heart God will not despise, I pray that tonight many would draw nigh to you. Help us to return to the intimacy that we once had. Lord, help us to sense your presence in our lives like we once did. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Our heads bowed, our eyes closed as the music begins to play. I invite you just to step out and come tonight. Just leave your seat and come. Would you do that? In just a moment, we're going to sing a familiar invitation song. That's right, you come, young or old tonight. I want you to know there's moms and dads. You need to hear from God just as much as any teenager. Whatever your rank in life may be, listen, you need to hear from God just as much as anybody who's working a blue-collar job. You see, the ground at the foot of the cross is level. Will you let God speak to your heart tonight? Folks are praying this evening. I want them to take the time that they need. Brother Lawrence is going to lead us in this familiar song. Oh soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. If you know the verse and chorus, I'm going to invite you to just sing it with us. Heads bowed, eyes closed. If not, you can hum the tune. But if you need to come, why don't you step out right now as these folks are praying as he leads us. Oh soul, are you weary? No light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the Savior and life for a content and free. Just as they continue to play tonight in a moment, we'll take a hymnal and we'll all sing the next or last verse, whichever Brother Lawrence chooses. We'll sing that as our closing song. But as I look around to the different folks in this room, some of you are teenagers tonight, I can safely say that what got me through my teenage years, as tumultuous as some of them were, was the communication I got from God. Having a young family, what was it that helped me to get a decent foundation after not being raised in a Christian home all of my life? Well, it was communication from God. I stand before you as a preacher tonight, sometimes put in situations where I don't have all the answers. You say, how do you make it to another day? It's hearing communication from God. Brother Lawrence, if you'll lead us in whichever verse you choose... 639 in your hymn books. Let's sing verse number two. Through death into life everlasting. Through death into life everlasting. He passed and we followed him there. Over us sin no more hath dominion. For more than conquers we. you, but I needed that tonight. And uh, two statements really caught my attention. If you want God's leading, look to God's presence. I think there's a lot of Christians that are going around lost. And the fact of the matter is, they'll continue to be lost until we learn to look for God's presence in our life. And then this question, have you lost the specialness of it? We talk about walking with God. What does that mean? I look at my kids at night and say the most important thing in life is to walk with God. What does that mean? The fact of the matter is it means his presence. And we can't walk with God 
without an intimate recognition of his presence in our lives. I trust as we go home and lay our heads on our pillows tonight, as we wake up and start our day tomorrow, that there will be a renewed intimacy of God's presence in our lives. Let's close in a word of prayer and we'll be dismissed. We look forward to seeing you back tomorrow night for the conclusion of our revival. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your presence. Thank you, Lord, that you've chosen to dwell in our hearts. We don't deserve it. But, oh, God, we're so thankful for it. Forgive us, Lord, for the times in our lives when we get busy and distracted. We forget about the fact that you are there. That you're speaking. That you want to hear from us. God, we want to walk with you. But Father, help us to learn what it means to love your presence. May we have a renewed passion in our hearts tonight to walk with you face to face. In Jesus' name, amen.